All right, so we are live and we are currently recording. Um, thank you for joining us today for the ZOR speaker series. Um, this is our first in our virtual speaker series. We are with um, Amanda Manahan today from the Oberlin Heritage Center. Um, the topic today is the Oberlin Colony, Utopian Ideals of Learning and Religion. Uh, Amanda has a BA in Anthropology from Heidelberg University and an MA in History Museum Studies from the Cooperstown Museum Graduate Program. She has been with the Heritage Center since 2015 and enjoys working with the staff, volunteers, and interns to preserve and share Oberlin's unique and significant past. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Great, thank you so much, uh, Tammy. And um, let me just get my screen up here. Um, yeah, thank you everyone uh, for, for joining us. Um, thank you to Historic Zoar Village for inviting me to speak on behalf of the Oberlin Heritage Center on the Oberlin Colony. Um, for those of you who may not have been to Oberlin or have not visited the Heritage Center, um, we uh, have three historic buildings that we have open for tours year round. Unfortunately, right now we're still currently closed. Um, we're hoping that uh, the conditions will allow us to reopen though, uh, perhaps in as little as a few weeks. So um, if you're interested in visiting, uh, keep an eye on our, our Facebook and our website. Um, and I'm really delighted to be able to share with all of you today this unique history of Oberlin, um, how the community both embodied and influenced national history from its earliest, earliest days onward. Um, Oberlin, it was actually one of the last settlements uh, to be established in Lorain County, and it was founded in 1833 as a, quote, Christian perfectionist community. Um, it was founded by ministers John J. Shippard and Philo Penfield Stewart. These men originally came from New England and they settled in Elyria, part of the Western Reserve of Connecticut. Um, however, by, the time, by that time, settlers began moving to the region. The American Indians who inhabited the lands had been long removed from the area and, you know, of course, being forced out by white Western expansion. The two ministers, when they um, meet in Elyria, they start discussing their religious views and they discover that they shared a, uh, several common beliefs. More so they believe that they could um, establish a sort of sin-free colony and they would form a school in the wilderness away from established communities that they viewed could contaminate their piety. And they heard about some cheap available land nearby in Russia Township and they set out to explore. There's a legend that goes with the founding of Oberlin, and, and I say legend because it really does change greatly from generation to generation. Um, but the, the legend I like to share is the men upon walking uh, for several miles in the wilderness from Illyria came to an area in which they decided to rest and pray for guidance. They settled beneath a large elm tree, and as they were about to depart, a hunter approached these two men and told them of a bear and her two cubs that had just come down from that tree only moments before the men arrived. So Shippard and Stewart, they took this to be a sign from God and they decided that this was the place for their great experiment, a perfectionist community. And the land was purchased from owners in, Conne in Connecticut and then the men set about establishing the colony in the woods. Oberlin was the chosen name for this community to honor John Frederick Oberlin or Jean Frederick Oberlin. Um, a deceased European pastor who had turned a failing French town into an industrious and, and spiritual one. The first settlers of Oberlin arrived in April of 1833 uh, with more colonists following over the summer and fall. The work to carve out the community out of the Ohio woods was, was incredibly daunting. By December of that year, enough of a community was established, however, for the founders to start their longest lasting vision the Oberlin Collegiate Institute, which was the first co-educational institution in the United States. And we'll explore more about that shortly. Values of Christian perfectionism set the tone for the early growth of the colony. And these values were integrated into daily life. To ensure support for these values and to keep out the quote, worldly sinners, settlers of the new community were required to sign what was known as the covenant of the Oberlin colony. The covenant, made up of 12 main tenants, 
uh, stress Christian values of learning and labor, plain and simple living, and they emphasize education. For example, item number six here states that we may add to our time and health money for the service of the Lord. We will renounce all the world's expensive and unwholesome fashions of dress, particularly tight dressing and ornamental attire. Not only was the wardrobe simple, but so were the homes and the interiors. By 1836, so within three years, newcomers to, the, to Oberlin were, not, were no longer required to sign the covenant as the community didn't want to exclude what they considered to be the, quote, real world. Uh, truthfully, I think the issue was that the colony was greatly struggling and they were not getting the support that they needed, namely people who possess the, the skills, the specialized skills needed by the community. And the community in a way advocated for a community purse. So there's a monetary issue here too. Um, this is further demonstrated by the fact that the earliest entrepreneurial efforts um, were owned and created to directly benefit the Collegiate Institute. And they were done so to prevent any sort of greed or corruption that might come from the drive to privately profit. Financial circumstances were somewhat dire in the early years and securing labor to manage these initiatives was difficult. And so therefore the college and the town started to become more and more these separate entities. So they were founded together, but they start splitting apart. Um, I think uh, um, more so because of this, uh, this initiative, um, and, but they do serve different and yet symbiotic roles. Uh, one supported the other. By 1839, the 100th and 140th signature on the covenant was its last. Uh, the, the covenant was officially retired. However, many of the principles outlined in the document survived for many years and even decades later. One in particular, the prohibition of alcohol, persist, persisted well into the 20th century. So for example, Oberlin, um, their first liquor license wasn't issued until the 1980s. So 1980s. The Oberlin diet best conveys the strictness of plain and simple living. The Graham diet, which was a popular fad um, that relied heavily on a coarse bread and strictly prohibited items that solely gratified the palate, uh, it prevailed in the community. The diet was created by Sylvester Graham and consisted of simply prepared bland foods with lots of whole grains, mostly fruits and vegetables, and absolutely no spices, meat, alcohol, or tobacco. Even pepper was banned. And whatever foods were permitted um, were to be eaten in small quantities at just two meals per day. The idea behind this was that ri consuming richer foods could lead to perhaps less full or impure behavior and thoughts. Uh, certainly this was something that Oberlin sought to avoid at all costs uh, due to its great experiment, co-education, men and women studying side by side. And then there was another thing happening around the same time, the Second Great Awakening. It was in full swing by the time that the Oberlin Colony began, and it was a Protestant revival movement that swept the nation from the late 1700s through the 1830s. The movement claimed that every individual could be saved through these massive revivals, um, repentance and conversion. Uh, it enrolled millions of new members to churches and led to the formations of formation of new denominations. During this revival, meetings were held in small towns and in large cities throughout the country. And there was a unique frontier institution that came about. It was called the camp meeting. Um, this is where communities would gather for outdoor revivals uh, in settlements that were yet unchurched. <clears throat> excuse me, unchurched. So this wave of evangelical revivalism led to the founding of numerous colleges and seminaries and uh, to the organization of mission societies across the country. Oberlin's own Charles Grandison Finney was one of the most well-known leaders of the last wave of this Second Great Awakening. Uh, prior to his arrival in Oberlin, uh, the first congregation founded in the community of Oberlin 
was founded in 1834, so within a few months um, of the start of the community, and it was called the Congregational Church of Christ at Oberlin, um, which later became known as First Church. Uh, founder John J. Shippard served as its first pastor, and congressional churches, congregational churches um, were really kind of more popular in the New England area. So that's, you know, the founders being from New England kind of brought that tradition um, where they're run by uh, congregational governance. Um, and um, and uh, at that time, there was no permanent sanctified church uh, in the community. So religious observations had to be held outside or in other buildings uh, across the college campus. But going back to Finney, a fiery preacher, um, Finney uh, delivered powerful and convicting messages uh, throughout upstate New York, um, an area that would later be called the Burnt Over District because it had been thoroughly burnt over with the flames of Christian revival. In 1835, shortly after um, his book, Finney's Lectures on Revivals was published, it had already sold over 12,000 copies and that was no small feat for that time. He was a revolutionary in the theological community because he championed the Armenian doctrine of salvation, um, which was the idea that people chose to that people chose to accept God in order to get into heaven. Um, the voluntary this voluntary way of thought, uh, though more commonplace nowadays, was actually very controversial back then, um, particularly to the Church of New England that believed that only a select few would be chosen by God to go to heaven, known as Calvinism. The, this ideology of Finney's proved stirring and went hand in hand with contemporary ideas of self-improvement, um, issues like social mobility and the widespread societal reform movements that were occurring during this era. So the distinctive Oberlin colony existed as a response to the widespread need for societal reform, and Finney's arrival in Oberlin in 1835 helped put the colony on the map. Um, he served as the minister in the community for nearly 40 years, and, and Oberlin proved to be a, very interesting for him. Um, he uh, was able to reinforce ideals of non-discrimination regarding gender and race and education. Uh, he was known to have uh, women pray publicly um, during his revival meetings, which was very unorthodox for the time, and female students continued to push Finney in return um, for equal treatment. So despite his position as a leader of the community in the college, Finney disagreed with some of the townspeople's attitudes stemming from the covenant. Um, Finney himself actually never signed the covenant. Uh, namely, Finney disagree disagreed with Oberlin's extreme austerity for the sake of piety. When one of his daughters was scrutinized for dre dressing too extravagantly on one occasion by the townspeople, Finney met this criticism uh, unfazed, and he said to his daughter, your dress is black and plain, and I think you're all right. Uh, he also abandoned the restrictive Graham diet. As I mentioned before, there was uh, really no formal church. Uh, Finney had to resort to preaching in a large tent located on the college square. His sermons, known to attract thousands of people, um, lasted for hours, and it must have been quite a sight to behold. Finney, again, being that fiery preacher, um, he would be swept up by emotion during his sermons, often yelling or crying. Um, the community and Finney also practiced calling out people for perceived sins in front of the whole congregation. And at times, massive public confessions would take place. For incredible violations of rules and blasphemy, speaking of confessions, uh, people could suffer significant punishments. For students, the rules were even more strict. Uh, within the Institute's bylaws, it stated that the following rules could result in discipline and possibly even deportment from the college, and that included uh, use of vulgar and profane words um, or vulgar and profane writings and actions. Um, gambling and playing games of chance were prohibited, use of alcohol, which we previously mentioned, writing or quarreling, um, um, and insubordination, particularly with some of the Institute's leadership, and use of firearms or burning of gunpowder without permission. Um, there were also violations against the church. For example, in 1837, a young man who traveled from Illyria to Oberlin on the Sabbath 
was admonished and forced to make a pu public confession for not being in church. Um, for offenses that would result in dismissal, there were really only two options. A full public confession would, or excuse me, a full confession would ensure a quiet and private dismissal, but no confession or repentance would, re would result in a public dismissal. So much more humiliating. Um, I want to briefly talk about this man too, Asa Mahan. Uh, he was another prominent leader in the Oberlin community. Um, he served as both the, the Institute's first president, and he is also kind of a self-appointed public voice of moral principles in Oberlin. Mahan was the foremost sponsor of uh, an idea called sanctification, uh, which is the act of a person becoming holy. He was also the most outspoken dissident of what he called the heathen classics. Uh, classics were a normal part of uh, college level education. It was really uh, expected at the college level. And so this, you know, the fact that the Oberlin Collegiate Institute did not offer the classics uh, was a source of much criticism from the outside world and academics. His writings and sermons were regularly printed in the biweekly Oberlin Evangelist, a local publication. And because of his strong, unwavering views, he faced a lot of criticism from both the outside world and eventually in Oberlin, uh, they would eventually tire of Mahan's ego. And he never backed down on his views, which ultimately led to his resignation in 1850. From there, Charles Grandson Finney actually stepped in as the second president of the college in addition to his um, minister duties. So after several years of preaching in the, that tent on the college square and in uh, other temporary locations, the community set about to create a grand church in the community. The cornerstone to what is known as the first church in Oberlin was laid in 1842. The first church was built from plans by Richard Bond, a prominent New England architect whom Charles Grandison Finney actually recruited. Um, the structure went up um, was actually a mix of Bond's specifications. He kind of had a plan already in place, um, but it also was combined with some of Finney's aspirations and the will of the congregation. Uh, Finney wanted an interior with circular seating that is kind of reflective of his tent revival um, and the arrangement that he had in, in New York City. Um, but his, the only part of that dream that was realized was a kind of curved balcony. So it is an incredible space. I, I highly recommend going in if you're able to. While uh, called the first church in Oberlin, the building also went by another name, the Meeting House. And that kind of um, signifies that it provided a purpose beyond just religious observation. It was designed to see 1800, and when it was completed, it was the largest auditorium west of the Alleghenies. Commencement exercises in August of 1843 were the first of many historic occasions uh, to take place within its walls. In a growing community uh, where the college was gaining a worldwide reputation, uh, thanks to Finney and their ideals, um, members of all faiths moved to the community and they were absorbed into this one congregation. By 1854, it boasted <clears throat> excuse me, 10 times the membership of any Congregationalist church in Ohio. And by 1860, it was the, one of the largest congregations in the country. For over the next half century, uh, very prominent speakers such as Ralph Waldo, um, Ralph, no, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, Frederick Douglass, Maya Angelou, Mark Twain, Booker T. Washington, Woodrow Wilson, Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of prominent speakers over its, its next century uh, spoke there. Originally, the college um, was meant to be a manual labor school, uh, a rather unique idea among American colleges at the time, with students re required to work four hours um, every day except for Sunday as part of their college requirements. And that's in addition to their classes and their studies. Young people who could not afford a college education elsewhere learned that at Oberlin, they could pay for their classes by working in the community. But there were many problems that the community encountered with this entrepreneurial um, idea. For one, the land was not suitable at all. 
uh, they essentially created a community on top of a wooded swamp. And efforts to create points of drainage could really only do so much. The roads in and to Oberlin were muddy. Oftentimes, wagons would become stuck. Some people actually discovered the community because they got stuck here. And after being forced to spend a bit of time in here, uh, they were actually um, kind of pleased with the community and they decided to move here or go to the college. Agriculture was incredibly difficult in early efforts to create a mulberry tree farm uh, to support a silk industry was a huge fail failure in the community. Um, there was only one source of moving water, a small creek, and so that limited milling and production. And the ultimate struggle of finding enough work for the students, um, it was very limited and that eventually killed the manual labor program. So stated earlier, the Oberlin Collegiate Institute was the first co-educational college in the nation, a fact that we greatly celebrate today. However, the intentions behind female education were not as progressive as one might think, and there were many dissidents to the practice. Founder John J. Shippard felt that women played an important role in, raise, in women raising Christian children. Um, and therefore, if women were to teach their children intelligently from the Bible, it was only natural that they needed to be educated as well. Women enrolled in what was called the female department or ladies course. Um, while they may be able to take college level courses, it did not lead to a college degree. There were many critics of this experiment of the quote amalgamation of the sexes and while both male and female students could attend class, dine together, work together, um, socializing was carefully regulated. Um, some male students and faculty feared that their association with co-education schools would actually discredit their educational reputation. Parents additionally feared that sending their daughters to a co-ed institution, um, you know, they feared it because they heard rumors and tales of immorality. Lyman Beecher, uh, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, warned of coeducation: the amalgamation of the sexes won't do. If you live in a powder house, you blow up once in a while. In addition to the academic requirements and limitations, um, a separate entity, oops, a separate entity um, was created to solely manage the female students. The Institute established a uh, ladies hall as an all female dormitory and they created a female department with its own principal and board of managers that oversaw the, the female students conduct and enforced these rules. So some of these rules included a curfew of 8pm or 730 in the winters. Uh, so women had to be in their rooms by a certain hour. They had to have permission to partake in activities after that. Um, female students additionally needed permission to visit places such as the post office or to go on walks, especially if a man was involved. Ladies were told to travel in groups of three or more for rides or picnics. And the strictest rule forced upon all the students was that no one of the opposite sex be allowed into private living quarters. And so there was a very serious um, instant, uh, instance of discipline uh, relating to the violation of this last rule. Um, in 1843, two young men, Walter Smith and Jonathan E. Ingersoll, had carried a trunk owned by a young woman to her floor where she resided. She was very sick at that time, and she was being cared for by other female students, um, and those students permitted the men to enter and put down the trunk. And after a series of um, meetings about the appropriate course of action, after the faculty heard about this, they expelled the men. However, most of the student body, you know, vehemently opposed the leadership's decision given the seemingly innocent nature of the visit, and they thought that the severity of the punishment didn't meet the crime. So petitions were sent around, the petitions were successful, and the students were allowed to return. However, the faculty's actions with this case put away any doubt that future violations would go unpunished. Now, by 1837, so about four years after the start of the Institute, um, four women challenged the regulation that women not be allowed to earn college degrees, and they requested permission to take the gentleman's course. And by 1841, 
three of the four women earned bachelor's degrees and they proved that women could in fact accomplish this task. And furthermore, they paved the way for future women to be able to enter the gentleman's course. However, female students were still greatly pressured by faculty and by their own families to pursue what they called the ladies course. So parents in particular feared that their daughters would become overly educated and therefore unmarriageable. And so this monument here that you see, um, it's near the art museum in town. It's called the Coeducation Centennial Memorial Gateway. It was erected in 1937 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Oberlin College's breaking of this gender barrier in higher education. <clears throat> so two of the more famous female students that came out of early Oberlin were Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown Blackwell. Um, Lucy Stone is probably the most famous person uh, to come out of Oberlin um, uh, during the 19th century. She actually came to Oberlin without the um, permission or support of her family. Um, and in order to support herself, she took a job as a teacher in the public schools. But then she figured out that she wasn't earning as much money as her male counterparts. And so she demanded to have that equal payment. And unsurprisingly, she was denied that. And so she resigned. But she was so popular with her students that, again, they kind of petitioned on her behalf, and she is rehired at equal pay. So Lucy Stone kind of gains a reputation in Oberlin as being um, eccentric, um, a little too progressive in a lot of ways. And so when Antoinette Brown comes to Oberlin um, as a student, she's actually warned about Lucy Stone. But the two become fast friends. Um, they actually form a secret debate society when they're prohibited from doing so in the classroom. Um, they um, both graduated in 1847. Um, Lucy Stone had very high marks. She was actually invited to um, have a speech during commencement, but she wouldn't be allowed to deliver it being a woman. It would have to be delivered by a male professor. So she outright refused to do this. Um, Lucy goes on to um, New, back to New England, to Massachusetts. Uh, Antoinette Brown stays for a little while longer in Oberlin. She, she wants to enroll in the theology department at the college, but she's not allowed to formally take the courses. So she kind of audits them. So even though she does all the work, she's never granted a degree for that work. Um, she goes on to become the first ordained uh, female minister uh, in the country, and Lucy Stone becomes very involved with the abolitionist movement, uh, with women's rights issues, um, such as suffrage. She actually is a founder of the American Women's Su Suffrage Association. And these two, men, two women remain friends for the rest of their lives. They write letters and upon letters to each other, uh, promising that they would never get married, but of course they both get married. And they actually marry into the same family. They marry brothers, the Blackwell brothers. Um, and um, you'll notice that Antoinette takes her husband's last name, but Lucy Stone does not. She's one of, if not the first documented woman in the United States to not take her husband's last name. So another kind of unique decision, in addition to co-education, was put forth in 1835 um, by the leaders of Oberlin, whether or not to admit African-American students. And so this decision was um, sparked by activities by a group of abolitionist students who left the Lane Seminary in Cincinnati after its trustees threatened to silence their anti-slavery voices. And so Oberlin, um, which was again struggling, sought to attract these defectors. Uh, they became known as the Lane Rebels and they wanted to convince them to come to the Oberlin Collegiate Institute. And the students seemed receptive to moving to Oberlin, but they were also wary. And so they issued a series of demands that um, were put forth to the trustees of Oberlin. Um, the two that I consider to be most significant was one, to allow for the formation of an abolitionist society that could hold open debates and lectures without fear of punishment or silencing. And two, that Oberlin allow all students, regardless of race, to enter the institution. 
So amongst the Lane Rebels, there was actually an African um, American student named James Bradley. Uh, James, as a child, had been taken from Africa and sold into slavery in the United States. Um, he freed himself and then pursued an education. And so the students kind of used his, you know, example um, as being a student at the seminary to kind of show to Oberlin, this is possible, we want you to do this. And so the decision did not come easily. Um, founder John Shippard was wholeheartedly invested in the idea of Oberlin welcoming students regardless of race um, or irrespective of color. And to show his determination, he publicly declared that his own future involvement with his community of Oberlin was contingent upon the Institute's acceptance of Black students. The underlying threat would be that he would leave. He would leave his community. Um, his co-founder, Philo Stewart, however, greatly opposed the measure. The board, as well as the town, was nearly split down the middle. And finally, the decision was made in favor of, of admission to students regardless of race. The act resulted in the resignation of two trustees. Um, some students ended up leaving the, the institution. And Stewart, the co-founder, who still had reservations, he did embrace certain practices that came out of this re resolution. However, he and his wife shortly departed um, from the community. These events would probably would never have transpired had it not been for the involvement of the Tappan brothers, uh, two wealthy merchants from New York City that funded abolitionist causes across the states. Oberlin came to learn about the Lane Rebels um, by the Tappans, and they were strongly encouraged by the brothers um, to you know, try to convince these students to come to Oberlin. The Tappans upped the pressure on Oberlin by promising financial support, and um, they also helped convince Charles Granson Finney to move to Oberlin. So because of this involvement in the trajectory of Oberlin, um, the town and college, it was forever changed. Um, so Oberlin College uh, opens up its doors in 1835 um, to students regardless of race, but also being a co-educational college, that means um, African-American women have opportunities now. Um, these two men represent uh, two of the earliest college graduates of the Oberlin Collegiate Institute. Um, James Bradley did come to Oberlin, but he enrolled in what was more of like a preparatory department, kind of like a high school equivalent education. George Vachon was the first African-American man to gain a college, a bachelor's degree from Oberlin College in 1844. He wanted to become a lawyer, but Oberlin, or excuse me, Ohio did not allow him to take the law exam. And so he does move to New York State and becomes New York State's first Black lawyer. Um, Ohio's first Black lawyer was actually John Mercer Langston, um, who graduated five years after George Vachon. John Mercer Langston actually stayed local for a number of years. Um, he was very invo involved in the Board of Education of Oberlin. After the Civil War, he's the first congressman, Black congressman from the state of Virginia. Um, he goes on to serve in the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and is a very influential figure that kind of takes his lessons from Oberlin and moves uh, beyond kind of spreading that word. Um, same can kind of be said for these two women. Um, Mary Jane Patterson was the first African-American woman to get a college degree in the country. Uh, she does so from Oberlin College in 1862 in the midst of the American Civil War. Um, Lucy Stanton Day Sessions was an early uh, Black female um, student. She enrolled in the ladies course, so it wasn't a degree, uh, but she um, was very influential in kind of uh, speaking about rights for uh, Black women um, at a time where there really weren't any discussions about these issues. And she was trying to convince white women to um, kind of um, take up the rally cry as well, um, saying that if one of us doesn't succeed, none of us succeed. Um, and um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, Oberlin um, was unique, uh, of course, during this time because of this, this, this proclamation, but also the town and college were 
almost universally integrated. Uh, the first church was an integrated space. In fact, a formerly enslaved man helped lay the physical foundation for the, the meeting house. Uh, the downtown was full of businesses, white and black, black owned. Uh, the college campus, dormitories, dining halls, classrooms were all integrated. Um, however, African-American citizens made up about 20% of the community's population, but only one in 20 students were black at the college. And there was still prevalent racism and discrimination at this time, and black students certainly felt isolated in their experiences. However, considering that this, this is all occurring uh, during the period of slavery in the United States, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. And um, so 1835, that's kind of the defining moment for Oberlin, um, that one, they initiate this policy that regardless of race, anyone can enroll. Um, that attracted a lot of Black families to Oberlin, and it kind of created a, a support group for, for other um, 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 African Americans who were moving through the area, whether legally or illegally. Um, the formation of the Abolition Society, over 76% of Oberlin joined up with that society in the first year. So now they're kind of taking more of a political stance um, of this moral issue. And because Oberlin is located so closely to Lake Erie with access to Canada um, that did not allow slavery and was kind of the um, place of salvation for people traveling the Underground Railroad, the Underground Railroad network becomes, uh, it, Oberlin serves as a crucial part of that network. And so the people of Oberlin um, would try to find a variety of ways to support abolitionist efforts, including the Underground Railroad. Um, slave catchers would come to town and the people of the community would kind of sometimes more passively try to interfere at first. They might uh, annoy a slave catcher with questions, kind of kill them with kindness until they would leave town. Um, they might act as decoys, and that's what you actually see here. Uh, black students would participate in a very dangerous activity. They would dress themselves up as freedom seekers, as runaway slaves, and they would act as decoys, um, trying to throw the slave catchers off the path where the real freedom seekers would be escaping in a different direction or possibly in a wagon being taken out of town. Um, students of the college were sometimes more radical and they would, after their education, would move to new communities and kind of spread this morality. But it was all very clandestine activity. We considered the town itself to be a station of the Underground Railroad, but it was still very dangerous activity. <clears throat> so not, it, it had to be clandestine because, again, not everybody in the community agreed with all of o Oberlin's morals and these these principles. Uh, for example, not everybody in the community was an abolitionist, um, and there was a very wide spectrum of what an abolitionist could be, um, and progressive views varied greatly. Um, and then, for example, a citizen named Chauncey Wack, who owned a tavern on the south southern outskirts of town, um, he was pretty much for everything that Oberlin was against. So you know, their locals and out-of-town visitors could partake in things that were difficult to find in the community, such as alcohol, tobacco, gambling, dancing. Um, Wack was also a Democrat who believed that slave owners had a constitutional right to claim ownership of human beings. There were many dissidents to Oberlin's early fundamentals, and one of the earliest and strongest was Professor John P. Cowles. Cowles opposed coeducation. Um, he often butted heads with Mahan over the Institute's decision to forgo Greek and Latin as courses of study, again, those heathen classics. Um, Kyle's views, particularly about the exclusion of the ancient classics in the curriculum, was very much in line with scholarly opinion at that time. Um, Kyle's also took issue with the dietary mandates, as I think a lot of us today might. Um, while some faculty and students exalted the benefits of the Graham diet on the mind, Cowles insisted that the physiological reform at Oberlin went beyond all measures, and he charged that the system had actually even caused the death of a lady student, a female student. Um, he accused the trustees about this diet, quoting, but you have simplified simplicity and reformed reformation 
till not only the health and lives of many are in danger, but some, I fear, have already been physiologically reformed into eternity. At least once, Kyle's took his meal at the public dining hall, and he brought a pepper shaker, of all things, to the table. It was ordered to be removed immediately by the trustees, and his subsequent dismissal by the board in 1839, he believed, was not unrelated to that offense. Kyle's went on to form a men's school in Elyria, and he had 16 letters attacking Oberlin published by the Ohio Observer, which served as fuel and ammunition for Oberlin's enemies. And now we come to perhaps the most prominent dissident of Oberlin, Delazan Smith. Smith came to the Collegiate Institute in July of 1835, so within weeks of the college's decision to admit students regardless of race, within weeks of the formation of this abolitionist society. And his main motivation to coming to Oberlin seems to stem from the Institute's promise of manual labor to help offset living and education costs. Upon his arrival, however, everything else about the colony seemed to confound Smith. And after finding himself at great disagreement with the faculty's religious doctrine, he was expelled in, spring, in the spring of 1837 for blasphemy. He was even briefly arrested by the community, um, although the arrest was deemed illegal and the charges were dropped. Uh, within a few months, a seething Smith published his thoughts in an 82-page diatribe that he sarcastically titled A History of Oberlin or New Lights of the West, but later became known as Oberlin Unmasked. And nothing is sacred or spared in Smith's pamphlet. Uh, topics of complaint included some which I think those of us today can somewhat sympathize with, um, such as Oberlin's ill-chosen land, um, disorganized academics, uh, manual labor taking time away from learning, and uh, harmful dietary restrictions. And one of my favorite excerpts from his publication is an original poem that he, he created. It says, venison is vile, a cup of coffee cursed, and food that's fried or fricasseed forgot. Duck is destruction, wine of woes is worst, clams are condemned and poultry's gone to pot. Pudding and pork are under prohibition, mustard is murder, pepper is perdition. And Smith, who arrived shortly after the Institute's decision to admit students regardless of race, was incredibly vocal about his views on this policy. He also reserved a large section for discussing the Underground Railroad activity and the, quote, miserable tidings of repeated violations of the laws of the country. And he further stated that to steal slaves from their masters and colonize them in Canada is the scheme of which, if Oberlin is not the originator, is most surely the abettor. He ended this section with a critique of Oberlin College President Asa Mahan, who reportedly roused the students to such illegal behavior by saying that Oberlin would fight until the last, law or no law, <clears throat> excuse me, law or no law, if authorities attempted to take them. Smith, with apparently no hint of his usual sarcasm, encouraged all Americans to pray that, quote, our country may be enabled to maintain the supremacy of her laws and whatever it has been, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Smith's rants also included uh, incredibly racist proclamations about the amalgamation of white and black students, as well as lurid details about amorous relations between students, as well as faculty and students. He also talked about shady finances and false representations of the institution, outright hypocrisy, and Oberlin's own righteousness and inflexibility. Smith claimed to write the pamphlet as a warning to others and to shame Oberlin for their vices. Just a few years after Smith's pamphlet was published uh, in spring of eight, um, was published uh, in the spring of 1840, the 38th General Assembly of the Senate of Ohio received a petition from citizens from Larian County uh, praying that the repeal of the charter of the Oberlin Collegiate Institute um, occur. <clears throat> Excuse me. A select committee had also received sundry letters and re uh, requests to make charges against the officers, managers, and teachers of the college. 
While it's difficult to know how impactful it was in these proceedings, it's quite possible that Smith's widely distributed Oberlin unmasked was somewhat influential. So to end, um, what is the legacy? Uh, although Oberlin's original fundamental beliefs greatly changed with the passage of time, the radical nature of the community persisted. As decades passed, Oberlin became swept up in national movements such as abolitionism, women's suffrage, the temperance movement, civil rights, and beyond. As people of diverse experiences and backgrounds moved in, into and through the community, the ideology changed internally in the community, but it also influenced those who would go out and then they themselves would change the world. Missionaries, for example, took the lessons learned in Oberlin and preached them in communities across the world from southern states to Africa to China and everywhere else in between. However, as history often reminds us, progress and success are rarely, rarely linear. Oberlin struggled with its own ideology post-Civil War and Reconstruction. Once slavery was ended, a big rallying cry in Oberlin died out. In what was once an integrated community, segregation became the new norm. Black-owned businesses were pushed more and more out of the downtown, and redlining practices ensured that African Americans could not build or, or move into homes in certain sections of town. Oberlin struggled with gender equality as well. For example, in the 1970s, Oberlin women's sports were funded $1,000 compared to men's $67,000. Oberlin today takes pride in its historic roots, and as we explore the impact of the founders and their vision on the trajectory of our community, the history only becomes more enlightening and interesting. And if you want to learn more, a book, a book that I personally recommend that elaborates more on Oberlin's transformation is called Elusive Utopia, The Struggle for Racial Equality in Oberlin, Ohio by Carol Lasser and Gary Kornbluth. So that brings us to the end. Um, I wanted to allow a little bit of time for a Q&A uh, or any comments that you may have. Um, I think you can pop on your video or put them in the chat feature. Uh, so I do see one um, from Tammy in the chat box. Where's First Church in this picture? And let me go back. I think I know um, perhaps which one you're speaking of. Maybe not. It might be in this picture here. Um, if you were referring to this picture, Tammy, uh, First Church had actually not been created yet. Um, it was more of a congregation than a physical building. Um, but it would have been located, um, so this is Main Street. Uh, Oberlin Hall is kind of um, right off of the square. So it would have been located further back over here. I had a comment, if I may. Yeah. Hi, this is William Vaudry, Oberlin class of 87. Thank you for a terrific address. I, I thought I knew early Oberlin history pretty well, but I really learned a lot, so thank you. You're welcome. One of my favorite stories about Charles Grandison Finney, which former Oberlin president Ken Starr used to like to tell, was that by the time he got there, women's co-education had pretty well taken root, but he was not at all comfortable with it, and not as ardent a supporter as some. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that he thought that women were far much far too great of a temptation for the gentleman students and that would distract them from their studies and the story goes he bumped into a young female student downtown one morning and thundered good morning daughter of the devil <laughs> and she very sweetly replied good morning father yes yes i think uh, i think that's certainly true i think you know when he came uh to oberlin there there were hesitations and certainly um, even though he was, I think, a pretty worldly minister, I think it, it took him a while to get used to that, to that idea. One other point, if I may, his, one of his daughters married... Um, James Monroe? Uh, no, uh, James Middle Jacob Middleton Cox, who became a Civil War hero and later joined the Oberlin Board and Cox Hall, which is now the administration building, uh, is named after him. And I always thought it'd be a very fearsome proposition to marry a daughter of Charles Grandis and Finney. Yes, uh, one of his other daughters married James Monroe, um, who became a, a congressman for the state and whose house that our museum um, occupies currently.
Amanda. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. Um, how many students actually left Lane to come to Oberlin? Do you know? I don't know the exact number. It was uh, at least a couple dozen students. Okay. I, I want to say it's probably between two to three dozen students, which was considerable at that time. It was very considerable at that time. Um, Asa Mahan also left the seminary to come to Oberlin. Um, he was on the faculty there. Um, and I believe another professor that was fired for encouraging the students came to Oberlin as well. Amanda, this is uh, Craig Stambaugh. Okay. I have a, a question. In, in the very beginning when they set up Oberlin, I noticed in the values that they had that list that you had this early slide. One of them was um, dealing with finances that everybody was gonna manage their own possessions. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, number two, um, they, they managed their own. And I'm comparing it to Zor where the Zorites all you know, signed a contract and everything was communally owned. Um, obviously this is quite a different situation here in Oberlin. Is there any history of, I, I'm reading this to say, okay, everybody manages their own wealth, but it must be available to be used to better the community or whatever. Uh, was there any um, history of there being a communal use of people sharing their, their wealth to, for the community, for community purposes? I mean, certainly they were encouraged to um, support things like the construction of the church. That was a huge fundraising initiative. Um, but the, coven the covenant was kind of done by that point. But certainly, I think that was put more in place to prevent any sort of, um, a, of greed, of corruption, of trying to take resources from the overall purpose of the community, which was initially this town and this town and college together. And so I think that's kind of what it's more alluding to. I don't have specific stories about people, you know, like a tax or, or, or like that, you know, it, uh, particular institutes, in, instances of having like that community purse, but that's what they advocated for. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Claire asked, I put the um, name of the book uh, in the chat feature. Um, it, I think it was published in 2018. Um, she also asked uh, about the conservatory. When did that become uh, so prominent? Uh, it was later. In fact, uh, Oberlin with its kind of religious doctrine um, viewed instru instrumental music as too worldly. Um, and that uh, the, really the only way to honor God through music was through voice, through vocals. Um, the exception being, pian not piano, excuse me, organ sometimes. Um, when Oberlin people wanted to bring the piano into the community in the 1850s and 1860s, there was a huge uproar um, because the piano was associated with sinful behavior like um, brothels. And so they didn't want to bring the piano into the community. That was a big struggle. But the Oberlin College Conservatory of Music was formed in 1865. I think it was the second conservatory to be formed in the country. It is the oldest continuously operated conservatory in the nation. Um, so it, it really took off uh, around the turn of the century. Um, and then of course they've just expanded it with each decade too. Amanda, I'm curious, does anyone know of any contact or communication between the communities of Oberlin and Thor? Um, I was speaking with Tammy before this. I have not been um, to, to historic Zoar Village, and it's, it's been on my list, and unfortunately my list is growing larger and larger as uh, time goes on and, you know, not able to, to visit museums, but um, it would be interesting because I was trying, in, in preparation for this, this program, I was trying to research um, religious communes and utopian communities in Ohio, and, you know, there is information out there, but it'd be nice to have kind of that, uh, that common thread outlined a little bit better. 
Thanks. So the and short answer, no, but should be. <laughs> yeah, one would think so. Yes. All right, are there any other questions for Amanda? If not, um, thank you, Amanda. Um, it was a wonderful presentation and I hope everyone can join us um, in April for our speaker series in April on Zor archeology. span um, And I said, there is one um, at Fort Lawrence coming up. If you'd like um, either of those links, um, just shoot me an email and I can get them out to you. Um, the speaker series will be available um, on Facebook. Um, Actually, it's kind of funny. Joseph By Miller has a live stream going on right now. We made a Joseph By Miller account for Facebook. So Thor's former leader is streaming on his Facebook. So I'll get it up to the Historic Thor Village Facebook page. And then um, we do have a YouTube channel. We're going to upload it to YouTube so you can watch it from there or share it with your friends. And we will have um, some physical copies in the Zor store as well, um, if you'd like a physical copy, like on a disc or a thumb drive. So um, that this speaker series and all the others will be available in all of those formats. Um, so I hope to see everyone um, virtually in April and then hopefully, fingers crossed, maybe we can get together in person in May. Um, but if not, I'll see you guys again virtually. So thank you everyone. And um, thank you again to Amanda. We'll give you a, a virtual round of applause there. <laughs> So, thank you. Hey, Tammy. Yeah. Tammy, this is John. I just want to thank you for setting up the technology and thank Amanda for the great presentation. And, you know, even though we want to make these live, I think like you and I talked earlier, the ability to, uh, for people in Texas or California, or for that matter, Germany to, to watch this, uh, you know, is, is a, you know, we're really, I think technologies, some of the technology coming out of the COVID-19 is going to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well, you guys have a good afternoon. Um, enjoy the sunshine. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Many thanks. Good day, y'all.